Welcome back to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Betty, it's no surprise that everyone celebrated your demise. And now worms are eating your eyes. So don't you worry, rotten head, as you sleep in your sodden bed. It's time to respect. Hi everyone, my name's Hoots. My name's Maylee Mandy. And I'm Kaylin Conrad. And this is Respect the Dead. Uh, So today we are following up Mandy's Thomas Edison uh, episode with one of Edison's contemporaries and besties, Henry Ford. So I I think I mentioned in the last episode uh, that I grew up in the town where uh, Thomas Edison had his winter estate. Mm -hmm. You did. He was neighbors and best friends with Henry Ford, who also had his winter estate there. And Harvey Firestone, not to be confused with Harvey Firestein, who was an icon. <laughs> I was immediately list- hearing his voice. <laughs> like- I know. Uh, Harvey Firestone <laughs> was the tire magnate. And in Fort Myers, where I grew up, they referred to them as the three famous friends because they were all like neighbors and best friends. They all had their winter homes down there. Mm-hmm. And as far as I know, they all sucked. <laughs> I don't know a ton about Harvey Firestone, but today we're digging into Henry Ford, who certainly sucked. I like how digging into him is like, if you actually picture it, knowing that he's a corpse, it's extra gross. <laughs> it's like we're just really digging mm, yeah. in. Digging in. Just digging in. <laughs> With a shovel. He's like all squishy <laughs> mm-hmm. and he smells weird and his eyes are jelly. And, and there's like, worms coming out of his yeah, eyes. They're coming up and greeting us like, hello. I like your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I love the I, I love the idea of worms liking our podcast. They're like, they're like it's such good representation. I literally do be <laughs> we, eating eyes. <laughs> we like the worm inclusivity of your podcast. Thank you for thinking of us. No one ever does. Worm <laughs> representation matters. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so Henry Ford was born on July 30th, 1863 in Springwells Township, Michigan, to William Ford, who um, I put in my notes was an Irish immigrant of English descent, because I felt like that that was like relevant. Apparently, his family emigrated to uh, from England to County Cork in the 17th century. So I was like, kind of sus that they were like English people who came to Ireland in the 17th century. I think they were probably colonizers. Mm. And then but his father was an Irish immigrant. Uh, his mother, Mary Littlegott Ford, was the daughter of Belgian immigrants. And as a teen, he apprenticed to a uh, machinist in Detroit. Um, so he was like working on machinery. Mm-hmm. And in 1891, at the age of 28, he got a job as an engineer at the Edison Illumination Company of Detroit. Hey, I know that name. So he worked for Edison, mm-hmm, <laughs> where he, uh, he was very quickly promoted to chief engineer, like within a couple of years. Um, and as chief engineer, he had the money and time to devote himself to experiments with gasoline engines. So he he was like genuinely a very um, a, a brilliant engineer. Mm-hmm. And by uh, 1896, he'd invented a machine that could be propelled using gasoline, uh, using a gasoline engine called the Ford Quadricycle. And I'm going to post a um, I'm going to post a link to it in the chat. You've probably seen it before. I'm going to show you what it looks like, yes, though. I need to see this. It's like a precursor to the uh, car. Um, these images, anything we discuss, will be on the on an Instagram post for yep. this episode. Yes, it will. Oh, look at oh it. Oh, my God. I love it's it. It's so cute. Isn't it? Do you oh, recognize it? This is adorable. Like, I, no, I don't know her, but I love her. It, I've, okay. I've seen it before. Yeah. I, I've definitely seen that image sometimes, before or something similar. Yeah, sometimes yeah. if you're seeing like old Nickelodeons or like movies that are set back in the uh, 19th century, um, they'll they'll show you like the Ford quadricycle. Mm-hmm. It was like a, a, a precursor to the car, yeah. which is like what Ford 
Ford was like working toward um, is is inventing the car. Right. And, and so Ford, like he, yeah, and he was an actual like inventor in the sense that he actually like worked on this stuff. He yes. wasn't just he was building off of. Yeah. He wasn't stealing from people like Edison was. Okay, he was like Edison <laughs> in that he was like an entrepreneur and a capitalist. Yeah. And in his uh, in the bulk of his career, he was just like overseeing things. But Ford actually was an engineer. Okay. And he, it, he he was quite brilliant. Okay. So it was around the same time that he created the quadricycle that Ford first met his boss and future bestie, Thomas Edison. Mm-hmm. He was like yeah. just basically introduced to him at a meeting in 1896. Henry Ford's goal, again, like I said, was to build a high quality automobile. Uh, but he also wanted to build one that was affordable enough for uh, mass consumption by the public, not just like to be used as a wealthy person's novelty item. So he kind of like he 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 really was like, oh, we could actually use this as like our mode of transportation yeah. uh, in, in the future. So he bounced around a bit, creating early automobiles, first for the Edison-backed and short-lived Detroit Automobile Company, and then at the Henry Ford Company, which confusingly was later renamed Cadillac hmm. Automobile Company, <laughs> before founding the Ford Motor Company that we know and... I guess a love no. today. I don't know, like that, we, that we're familiar, familiar with today. today. Or today. Or today. <laughs> I, I mean, I've never owned a Ford. Currently, I have an Italian car that, that to be fair, sucks. <laughs> um, but like, I, I've never owned an American car. I, I'm quite partial to Toyotas, actually. So he, uh, the Ford Motor Company was founded in 1903. Ford Motors really popped off with the Model T, which was invented in 1908 and was relatively cheap, very inexpensive and easy to fix if it broke down and was produced kind of en masse. And by the 1920s accounted for half of all the cars in the US. And and the Ford Motor Company was uh, most notable for also implementing the very first assembly line mm. in 1913. Yeah. So th- this is like what really makes him like a big deal is he's the first person to put together a car assembly yeah. line. Yeah. And that reduced car building time mm-hmm. from about 12 and a half hours per car to 93 minutes. Oh, wow. Holy shit. That's, that's a, that is a difference. Yeah. So yep. significant. And I would assume all those extra profits and all that time back was passed directly down to the people making the car? <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh. Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Silly Kaylin. That's Ooh, not how capitalism ooh, works. We're, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. <sighs> but I mean, like 12 and a half hours to 93 minutes is like That's a significant reduction in time. By the, by the early 20s, they were literally producing like 10,000 Model Ts a day, Damn. which isn't like anything compared to what we have now, yeah. but like compared to like what they have i mean you could you could only make two cars in a day before <laughs> right so the car assembly line allowed the company to mass produce model t's which first dramatically reduced their price so there was more demand for them and then profits yeah. soared because so many more people were buying them but it also made the job of assembling cars suddenly much more like monotonous monotonous and less fulfilling for factory workers like before these were like craftsmen who were yeah. building these cars and you need like less less like complete skill sets mm-hmm. even yeah like you just all needed yeah. to know how to do mm-hmm. one tiny piece. You stopped being an engineer and a craftsman and you started being just a factory yep. worker. Yeah. So employee turnover at the Ford Motor Company just skyrocketed yep. Yep. to as much as 370%. And as a result of this, Ford became a devotee of welfare capitalism, mm. wow. which he expressed. Yeah, that's what we have a lot of in the U.S. today, oh. where, um, you know, uh, major corporations mm. are uh, create lots of benefits and bonuses, including things like health care and dental in order to uh, encourage employees to remain with them. His uh, Was he the sorry, was he the like. Uh, innovator of that or was that like a thing at the time do you know that was a thing at the time yeah. um he wasn't he uh it, it, yeah he wasn't the first person to adopt it in the way that he was with assembly lines uh, but mm-hmm. he was an early devotee of it and it was like a a thing both in the u.s and in europe okay uh gotcha but uh his was expressed mostly through a massive 
wage hike to reduce turnover and increase employee loyalty. So in 1914, the Ford Motor Company announced an initiative to double factory worker pay to about $5 a day, which was a around $139 to $146 in today's money, depending on your source. So like, Hmm. not not bad for for like a factory worker. Yeah. However, Mm. and I'm going to quote a write up uh, from history.com. While $5 a day was a generous factory wage at the time, it came with a substantial catch. Technically, workers pay remained less than or near 250 a day and the extra money was a bonus they had to earn. Mm. The year Ford introduced the bonus, he established a company sociological department that sent inspectors to the homes of his employees uh, at this point mostly uh, male immigrants to make sure uh, they were living in a way Ford approved of. Uh, workers were denied the full $5 a day if their wives worked outside the home, if their home if their homes were unclean, if they displayed signs of drinking or gambling, if they took in borders or if they didn't contribute to a savings account. Uh, This desire to control his workers and his belief that he could, quote, improve them would become characteristic of Ford's management style. What the literal fuck? Number one, I would be making, I would be paying him $5 an hour after he saw my home. I need you to uh, understand that this whole time that Hoots was saying all of that, Galen and I could not have looked more horrified and angry because we were just like, excuse you? You're going to tell me what? No, my home has nothing to do with you. Get out of here. I mean, I, no one in this in this chat window right now would be making $5 yeah. a day. No. Like, <laughs> I don't, you you come to my home? All of us filthy degenerates. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll go work putting buttons on a also, shirt for eight hours instead. Thanks. Like, okay, daddy, you aren't going to give me enough allowance because my room is messy. Right? <laughs> and my wife had to get a job what because a, you're only paying me two fifty an hour. It, it really, a day, rather. It really um, reflects that kind of like weirdly like almost paternalistic mm-hmm. kind of, um, I don't know, persona that some of these capitalists like hold on to. Where they're like, oh, I'm doing this for you, my employees, my team, my cast members. Like, yeah. it's, it's just so creepy and weird to be like, I'm helping to improve your lives yeah. by coming to your house and telling your wife to stay in the kitchen and clean it more. Like, what the I fuck? I love that you use the term <laughs> paternalistic because one of the mm-hmm. other terms for welfare capitalism is industrial paternalism. Oh, yeah. Because it's exactly that. Yep. It, it's it's exactly yeah uh huh oh, it's so gross, fucking capitalist daddy get he, out of here. He looks like Voldemort with a nose. Oh, he looks so scary. Oh. Um, he's he's very frightening. He looks like a murderer. He looks like, like he murdering. literally looks like a snake person. I mean, yeah. Thomas Edison uh, yeah. is no looker, mm. but he, at least he looks friendlier than Henry Ford, who looks exactly as evil as he was. Thomas Edison looks like a yeah. person made by people. <laughs> person made by people. <laughs> Henry Ford is like ha- s- very far removed. If you enter old Voldemort into like one of those AI generators, you get Henry <laughs> Ford. <laughs> I'm gonna like yeah, I'm gonna go to like Bali or whatever the fuck it's called and like type in like Ford like possible <laughs> anti-Semitism or something, and I would get a photo of him. So the history article continues in 1913. He established an English school for workers because he thought the company would be safer and more efficient if everyone spoke the same language, but also (laughs) because he believed immigrants should abandon their own languages and cultural practices, according, uh, says Matt Mm. Anderson, curator of transportation at the Henry Ford Museum. According to Reverend Samuel Marquise, the Episcopalian minister Ford hired to run the company's sociological department, attendance was compulsory (laughs) and a worker who hesitated was, quote, laid off and given a chance for uninterrupted mediation and reconsideration. We seldom fail to change his mind. Yeah, because he had just gotten fucking <laughs> fired temporarily so until he like, agreed to yeah. go to fucking English school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they'd be like, fuck, I need to make money. I guess I'm going to English school. Oh, my fucking God. Right. Because like, what choice do you have? You Especially the, the kind of wages they yeah. were offering. It's like you can really feed your family with yeah. that. Maybe make a little progress in your own life. Like, yeah, that's hard to walk away from. So, of course, you're like, fine, I'll go to the stupid English school and learn this dumb Conform language. Conform or starve. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. 
Jesus. Okay, this was, to me, this was the darkest thing. Uh, so the English school's graduation ceremonies no. made graduates dress in stereotypical costumes of their cultures of <gasps> origin and oh, approach no. a oh, stage no. on which there was a huge melting pot. Oh, no. And graduates <laughs> would walk behind the melting no. pot, change clothes, <laughs> and emerge from behind the pot wearing a suit and tie to symbolize becoming American. No. <laughs> this is like a high school Thanksgiving play. I'm like, this is the worst it's thing I've so ever dark. heard. Oh my this is god, so disgusting. it's so disgusting. It's dark. so ugly. It's so dark. That's what an so ugly gross. fucking man. That's so gross to make a person do like, hi, not only do you have to learn this language, because if not, we will literally not pay you to do this job, but also you have to stand in front of a bunch of people in your, your native dress, walk behind a thing and then be dressed as a quote proper American. It just, Wow. wow. Is it actually their native you dress or did they provide the Oh, outfit? yeah. There's that question it, too. The yeah. article called them stereotypical costumes. So I'm sure they were either provided okay. or requested to was, source stereotypical versions of what they would wear. It was, it was the party city. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, party like, yeah, city version. Probably. I mean, this is around the time that my mom's family came to the U.S. And they would have just worn like, you know, a cotton shirt and a cotton pair of trousers or or a skirt at the time mm -hmm. so this would be like making them dress in like a, like a traditional like um finish dress with like a fucking hat making them look like a fucking elf or something <laughs> right and then having to, like, them really change play it into, up. yeah yeah to play it up yeah. um, because a lot of a lot of these immigrants were like from like germany or from like slovakia or that kind of thing so mm -hmm. again it'd be like people from europe who came over wearing like cotton outfits but then they'd be like right. can you go find like whatever uh your people wear and, you then, like, and then we you want you to weirder so, yeah you we want weirder. you to symbolically <laughs> then like become homogenized they yeah. like they're like oh sorry i actually forgot my special outfit can i still graduate they're like don't worry we have like several windmill costumes in the back that you can put on yeah <laughs> the, we've the got these wooden shoes <laughs> Like the equivalent today would be like someone wearing like a really outland, like a really over the top stereotypical, uh, uh, yeah, costume from like a Halloween store, walking behind the thing and then coming out wearing like like khakis and a button down shirt. Be like, oh, yeah. you're now American. Congratulations! Like, like if if like if if like your exchange student from Germany, you were like, can you get some later hosen maybe? <laughs> and they're like, I've never even seen later hosen in my life. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then and then you make them change into like a hoodie and jeans um, to show yeah. that they become Americanized. Um, it's fucking disgusting. Oh, my God. Look how normal and happy you are oh, now. I, it's, it's so it's dark. It's so fucked up. It's so dark because mm. it's just like, it, can you please symbolically represent how you're uh, losing everything about your identity to fit in with the crowd? Yeah. It's fucked up. It's so fucked up. So by the 1920s, um, a lot of black Americans had moved to Michigan as part of the Great Migration, which was like the mass relocation of black Americans from the rural south to other parts of the U.S. following the Reconstruction and early Jim Crow eras. There were like many mm -hmm. mass waves of mm -hmm. um, black people getting the hell out of Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, Henry Ford paid black factory workers the same as white factory workers for the same jobs. Oh. So he kind of got like a reputation of being like more progressive than he actually was because black workers were not eligible to rise to certain positions mm. because Ford believed that they were genetically inferior. <laughs> and so most of them continued working for lower wages in the foundry in the forge at the Dearborn, Michigan factory. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, he got a reputation for being. And he still gets to control their lives. Like he still oh, gets totally. Like also, it's notable that like they continued working at the foundry and the forge, which are like the lowest paid and most dangerous positions. Yeah, that of course. Uh, yes, like other white factory workers would start there too, working the same, uh, making the same wages as the black workers. Yeah. But then they would be allowed to rise among the ranks. Whereas right. it's like, well, I don't think you're ready for it. For, for the black people. So yeah. he got like a, an unearned reputation of being like a woke king for um, <laughs> right. paying more than like other factories in the area were paying black people, which is like a 
a significant thing to note too, because if they went to another factory, they would be paid less than their white counterparts. Yeah. So like Ford was the best mm. they could get. And it was still shitty. <laughs> it was the best they could get and it still sucked. And it was yeah. still shitty yeah. and they would stay there. And yeah. Um, and 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 uh, you can imagine that he probably had his own reasons for wanting to offer them like he could offer them that kind of money and then he would constantly have a workforce with low turnover yeah you know it, it, that'll stay in those shitty areas and then the fact that he had all those um uh the requirements about like if you want to get bonuses or whatever you have to have like a clean house and all this other stuff like how many i mean i i, I can't speak from like innate knowledge here or anything but like how many black households could afford to only have one just the husband working you know what i mean like how yeah. many women were also probably working too women, so women of get color these... have always worked yeah exactly women of color have always yeah, had to exactly. go work so like like nannies and housekeepers i can't imagine that the women were, yeah and, the and women were out working too yeah very often like i mean he had his uh prohibition of of borders and things as well and it's like well how many yeah how many black households had like cousins that would come live with with them right and would he count those as borders or as immediate family yeah. like because again elderly like, these were people relatives. who were yeah. leaving the south in mass waves to yeah. get away from the racism down there to mm -hmm. get to the less bad racism of the north and the west <laughs> the passive aggressive racism <laughs> i doubt many of them actually made that five dollars a day yeah. they probably made 250 a day yeah, whereas probably at, you know other factories they would have made less than a dollar but you can also mm -hmm. say that that's just on them for not being moral enough to to like get five dollars that's know. you can do it if you want that's to that's what he would have said you <sighs> yeah. pull yourself up by your oh bootstraps get comfortable in your khakis and just be a normal person obviously and then you'll be fine really? pull that's yourself how that up works by your boy boss straps mm -hmm. <laughs> your boy boss straps <laughs> So Can't. Ford was quite unsurprisingly staunchly anti-union. No. Uh, most welfare <laughs> capitalists are um, because because unions threaten that whole idea of industrial paternalism. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, give, they give people more um, uh, self, uh, um, not actualization, um, autonomy, more mm -hmm. autonomy. And he took to surveilling his employees and engaging them with violence in order to quash any threats of unionization. Uh, <laughs> so in 1932, Ford's private police force, known as the Ford Service Department, oh, and the normal police, in, in combination with the normal police, a cab, <laughs> tear gassed, fire hosed, and opened fire on unemployed auto workers marching for the right to organize during the Great Depression, killing five of them and wounding sixty. Jesus. So, like, during the Great Depression. <sighs> Some auto, some unemployed auto workers started marching, doing a peaceful protest uh, in Michigan for the um, the right to organize. And the cops and F Ford's fucking private police force murdered five of them in nineteen thirty. They're, like, they're just random citizens. They're just, like they're not employed by they're him. Not employed, they're just they're not his they're employee. Starving during the Great Depression. I mean, not like it's okay to. <laughs> I like I'm not saying it's okay to murder your employees but like who the fuck are you like it's just like such a like purely selfish thing it's not like get back to work it's like you'll never work again yeah, it's gonna kill you. so fucking unnecessary <laughs> like dude <laughs> what the hell and I mean again at any point in history uh, they should be able to march for their right to organize but like it's especially egregious during the Great Depression. Yeah, when 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 there's mass unemployment <laughs> yeah. everywhere, everyone's starving. Or, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, for sure. It's it's uh, just especially if, a bad look. Yeah, this is a bad look. If any time to allow people to be like, hey, we need to be able to uh, advocate for ourselves, it's during the Great Depression, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So oh in 1937, God. the United Auto Workers Union organized a series of peaceful sit down protests for higher wages, shorter hours and improved work and co worker conditions. And those are exactly what they sound like. There would be like a certain hour of the day where they tell union members like working at these various factories, like, hey, you're going to sit down and refuse to work. Mm -hmm. So they successfully um, organized at Chrysler and General Motors. Uh, but when they set their sights on Ford Motors, the Ford Service Department, that private police force that was made up of, quote, 
ex-convicts, ex-athletes, ex-cops, and gang members, according to a write-up in the Smithsonian, showed up. I like that the gang members weren't exes. <laughs> they, were, they were the one people. No, no, we're still gang Current members. gang members. <laughs> I mean, the Ford Service Department was basically a gang. I mean, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They showed up and just beat the shit out of them. It was known as the Battle of the Overpass and ended with a union organizer being thrown off of an overpass by Ford's private police, breaking the man's back. Jesus. The private police also beat up a bunch of women who oh were part of the uh, UAW auxiliary, which I think just means that they were there to support loved ones in the union. <laughs> Look at that supportive wife over there. Get her! Yeah, like, beat the shit out of oh her. Oh my what the fucking fuck? god. I mean, I'm not surprised, but like... Because this was 1937. I know that that's like something the cops always do, but like, I, like, I know that a lot of the police forces and like independent police forces were literally just created to fuck with unions and shit. Yeah. yeah. But like it just the thought of someone being thrown over a fucking overpass mm-hmm. is like so like at what point are you like, oh, no, I was definitely protecting the public mm-hmm. yeah, by throwing this person off by, an overpass. That was necessary. Throwing this man over an overpass and then going and punching his wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes, great. This this is how we protect America. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was 1937. Uh, so that would have been two years before the Second World War. Again, none of those factory workers were women just yet. But speaking of the Second World War... Henry Ford maintained a pacifist position in both world wars, but not for the reasons you might think someone might be anti-war. Mm. Ford wanted the U.S. to remain neutral mm-hmm. because he believed that both world wars were an international conspiracy orchestrated by the Jews. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Oh. I'm like, this is going to get real bad eventually. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Of God damn course. It. So Ford was a lifelong anti-Semite, so committed to the cause that in 1918, he bought a struggling local paper, the Dearborn Independent, and turned it into his own personal Jew-hating zine. In 1920, he started publishing a weekly series called The International Jew, (gasps) The World's Problem, based on the protocols of the Elders of Zion. Wow. Are you guys familiar with the protocols of the Elders of Zion? I'm not. I've never heard of it. A little. Okay. So for for both of you and for our listeners, um, this is kind of sadly an important document. Uh, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was a a hoax document created by a member of the Russian secret police around the turn of the 20th century. So like while Nicholas II was in power and Anastasia was alive and all that shit. Mm -hmm. It's... uh, it's like where the whole anti-Semitic conspiracy about Jewish world domination comes from. Mm. And it's either directly or indirectly to blame for pretty much every pogrom that's occurred from the early 20th century to today. So the protocols were claimed to be the top secret records of a meeting of Zionist leaders in Basel, Switzerland in 1897, during which a conspiracy was launched for a socialist Jewish-led takeover of the financial cultural and government levers of power but it was just it was it was completely a hoax and it was it was like um it was it was debunked like very early on it was debunked in the early 1920s um in Mm -hmm. um a london magazine i'll I'll look that up. Future Amanda, look that up. Future Hoots. <laughs> future Hoots. <laughs> hey, this is Future Hoots here. And the magazine I was thinking of was The Times. Uh, so The Times exposed the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as a forgery all the way back in 1921. And it was actually their Constantinople reporter, uh, an Anglo Irish man named Philip Graves, who uh, discovered that. The vast majority of the protocols of the elders of Zion were actually plagiarized from an obscure French political satire, like a, like an obscure satirical poem about Napoleon. So that's weird, right? <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck? So... The um, 
The hoax was pieced together from a variety of unrelated sources, including an anti-Semitic German novel and a French piece of satire. Um, there was just like a satire of Napoleon the Third. Had not, it didn't even mention Jewish people in it. Hey, this is Future Hoots again. So, apparently, I mentioned the French poem thing uh, and some other stuff. <laughs> Apparently, I did do my due diligence while I was researching this episode. Um, but we record so many weeks in advance, and I'm going to be honest, I am blackout drunk every single time. So I completely forgot about the French poem thing. <laughs> Oh my god. They they changed a few names. So in his International Jew series, Ford blamed the Jews for everything from labor unions to short skirts to jazz music, <laughs> which he called Yiddish moron music. <laughs> <gasps> he's, he's legitimately such a patty little man. It's just like an angry old man yells at Cloud. Oh my and god. <laughs> So he he was like the first Alex Jones. Totally. Like, <laughs> just screaming about the most random shit. I love that like, he's like mad about short skirts is, and he's like, it must be oh the Jews. Skirts must be the Jews. Like if you were to look at like any like traditional oh Jewish dresses or skirts, I don't think so they would bizarre. be super skimpy. No. <laughs> like, like you're not seeing like many Down like Hasidic ankles. Jews in like mini skirts. No. Like, I, like I what is think, this even? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, I mean, I'm not exactly familiar with all of the history of Jewish fashion, but I can't ever say I've ever been like, oh, yeah, short skirts make me immediately think of. And I mean, like uh, Jewish uh, people like that's just a definitely random not more fucking than thing. like any other. Like uh, when I think short skirts, I think like Roman men. Right. No, exactly. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> I think he was just like he was an old man who was mad yeah. and like anything he was mad at, he wanted to blame on the Jews. He was just mad. I just I, it was like the original. He, he was stub my toe. Must have been the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I was that, angry about that anything. Meme that with like him. a guy riding a bike and then he puts his stick in the wheel and then he falls down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Ford. <laughs> the Jews did this. It's like, Henry Ford. <laughs> According to a write-up in the Washington Post, he also apparently called Prohibition-era whiskey N-word gin. Uh, oh, so my gross. Fucking Which he also, God. I think, blamed on Jewish people. <laughs> I haven't read any of the International Jew, obviously, but according to Wikipedia, oh, there was an article in the series. I don't. You're not subscribed to a Substack. <laughs> There's an article in the series titled Gigantic Jewish Liquor Trust and Its Career. <laughs> so I, I think he blamed whiskey. Wi w yeah, we're not. Yeah. The bad. Bad word whiskey. <laughs> Anagram of ginger, uh, uh, no. <laughs> gin. <laughs> oh my god, what a he blamed that on the Jews, no. too. <laughs> this reminds me of that. Um, there's a clip from some, I think it's like a UK show where the guy's in the car and he says something about, like, you know, the car's not working, and he's like, ah, this is because of the Jews. And then the other guy that's in the car is like, what what's going on? What are you talking about? What, what parts in this car are Jewish? And he just starts, like, randomly pointing at things. <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, th this is a Jewish conspiracy <laughs> to keep me from getting somewhere. I don't know. It's really wild and silly. It has that same vibe of just, that's like, kind of, just yeah. make shit up and then see if it sticks to the wall. <laughs> like, that's all anti-Semitic con conspiracies. I mean, that's all. That's all any of these stereotypes. Or he's his any own of those Alex kind of, Jones, yeah. though. Like he's just. I'm pretty sure Alex Jones has pulled from the protocols of the elders of Zion as well. Like, oh, I'm sure. It's, oh, I'm it's sure. like I'm one sure. of that and the Turner Diaries are like yeah. the two most. Uh, we gotta do we gotta do a special series on like dead literature or something and, and talk yes. shit about these bad books. Yes. <laughs> um, so F Ford published his hate rag in the Dearborn Independent for literal years, and he extended its reach by also distributing it in Ford dealerships throughout the country. <laughs> <laughs> no. So Imagine like, going to buy a car and you get this guy's shitty zine, yeah. <laughs> the shitty anti-Semitic zine. That's like if a anything in the car breaks. It's the Jew's fault. Oh, like, God. <laughs> and this shitty anti-Semitic zine. It's like buying a car in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> <sighs> oh, okay. <no. laughs> 
So Henry Ford is the only American praised by Adolf Hitler by name in his 1925 <laughs> manifesto, Mein Kampf. Quote, it is Jews who govern the stock exchange forces of the American Union. Every year makes them more and more the controlling masters of the producers in a nation of 120 millions. Only a single great man, Ford, to their fury, still maintains full independence. I... When you get a shout out from <laughs> literal Hitler, from literal maybe, Hitler, maybe <laughs> it's time to like take a step back off a cliff. Like there's like <laughs> that's that's one of those moments where you hope they self reflect and go, "Are we the baddies? <laughs> like maybe I've done something wrong with my life." If Adolf Hitler is endorsing me, like has like a blurb on the front of your book, like a showstopper couldn't put it down. Loved every second, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I've got good news, Mandy. He did not. Okay. <laughs> I get, I'm not surprised. However, two years later in 1927, Ford was sued for libel uh, by a Jewish business owner because of his shitty paper. Good. The suit ended in a mistrial, uh, but Ford did issue a public apology and retracted some of his anti Semitic comments, blaming his underlings of the paper to avoid <laughs> responsibility. I, I half expected <laughs> that sentence and blaming the Jews themselves and moving on. <laughs> It was that. Se- it was the. Se- it's not my fault. <laughs> it was those self-hating Jews interns that I hired. <laughs> yeah, right. <sighs> Blaming interns is really Jeez. just a time-honored tradition. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, they didn't send me the memo that it was so Jesus. after that he at least showed like a little bit of caution he was all like I misspoke when I wrote about international Jews I'm actually just mad about international bankers <laughs> you guys it's totally a different thing did he change the name <laughs> to international bankers of, of the magazine no <laughs> did he no he just stopped okay <laughs> he, uh, so the the newspaper was called the Dearborn in- Independent the series was called the International Jew so he, he did stop publishing the International Jew but okay Okay. Uh, in in further um, uh, op eds in his newspaper, he called them international bankers, okay. which is totally different. Mm. <laughs> and thank God that never like was dogs all that around used... the world are like whining and lifting their ears yeah. into the <laughs> air. Bark, 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 bark. <laughs> uh, so Hitler was at this point just a huge fan of Henry oh Ford, uh, and pamphlets of Ford's "The International Jew" circled Europe published in four volumes by a member of the Reichstag. A Detroit newspaper reported in 1931 that Hitler regarded Ford as his inspiration. Hitler kept a life-sized portrait of Henry Ford next to his desk (laughs) and stated ominously, I shall do my best to put his theories into practice in Germany. What? (laughs) Oh my God. Both of your mouths are just like gaping. He was Hitler's daddy. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> Hitler was the biggest that Henry needs- Ford fanboy. He was like, and this is so funny because like, like Walt Disney gets this reputation, mm-hmm. and like we will t- cover Walt Disney one day. Will, but like oh with the God. Walt Disney stuff, it's much more tenuous. Like it's much like uh, there. Maybe he was a fan, but maybe he like just saw a couple of the cartoons. Hitler like unequivocally was like i am fuck i've got a hard on for henry ford no not this like third reich bff boy boss like uh uh-huh. this oh my god no um, i just would like to suggest that On the title desk. of this podcast episode should be henry ford and then the parentheses or whatever uh, hitler's daddy oh, <laughs> that was just too good Ooh, love you um, henry ford son oh, no. <laughs> 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 it's it so, so gross. Like, imagine being okay, the person like, who inspired Hitler. <laughs> like, he's on his little Pinterest board. I'm Hitler's. Hitler Pinterest was board. like, now that is an anti no, no. <laughs> Live it up to you, King, every day. <laughs> just do it for Henry. <laughs> I just spit. I just spit back into my drink. Oh my god. Okay. So Henry the uh the Ford first Volkswagen fight. was actually based on the uh Ford Model T as well. 
you know how like uh, Volkswagen was like a Third Reich enterprise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The very first Volkswagen was heavily based on Ford's Model T. Mm-hmm. And in 1938, just over a year before the outbreak of World War II, Henry Ford was presented with the Grand Cross of the Supreme Order of the German Eagle, the highest honor bestowed upon foreigners by Nazi Germany <laughs> for his 75th birthday. And here is a photo of him receiving it. No. Oh my God. He looks so happy. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm so proud of so proud of my daddy's son. <laughs> <laughs> my that daddy's son is insane. <laughs> oh, what a piece of fucking shit. It's like, I'm gonna put this on my special. Oh god. He's like, Well, yes, I am an anti-Semite. Thank you for this honor. <laughs> um so Ford Motors Sorry. would con- <laughs> Ford Murders. Ford Motors would what? continue. <laughs> Uh, They would continue to collaborate with the Nazis until 1942, a year after the United States entered the war, manufacturing Jeeps, trucks, and tanks for the Axis war machine. And to this day, the Ford Motor Company insists that they had no control over their German (laughs) subsidiaries. Okay. Okay, bro. Um, Okay. The Nazis loved your guy. (laughs) Um, Okay. You would think that the American government would use the fact that they're collaborating with the Nazis as an excuse to like steal their company from them or something at least. Right. Like Mm-mm. to now a lot of like, to no, like that's a pretty good reason to stop them and obtain their company and all of their assets. Like, well, I think the problem was, and, and, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong about this hoots, but I think there were a lot of American like businessmen who had like invested interests in like, uh-huh. Uh, certain top ranking German industries and such. So basically it would have screwed them over, I think in the process somehow, I think is how that would have worked. Like if they had taken, if the U S government had taken over, they would have gotten screwed and lost money. So of course we can't do that. And they probably lobbied very hard against that. We didn't touch them. Ford. Ford was not the only U S company that um, was, uh, was collaborating with the Nazis. And and not even the U S the only U S auto company like GM did as well. (laughs) They, they Um, was a mess. Yeah. Like <laughs> well into like the 90s and 2000s, there were still like court cases trying to untangle how much the Swiss banks were involved in collaborating with the Nazis. Yeah. Like, um, there, like there were so many, basically every rich person uh, in the Western world was was collaborating with the Nazis. Yeah, um, and world governments were just happy to look right. the other and way. Nobody would remain in power if they pissed off the rich mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So Hitler, of course, wasn't the only Nazi fanboy of Henry Ford. In a letter written in 1924, Heinrich Himmler described oh, no. Ford as, quote, one of our most valuable, important, and witty fighters. Oh, he's witty. <laughs> he's not witty. <laughs> he's so oh, funny. No. His answer is so funny and smart. Funny. His daddy, you're so funny. <laughs> Hitler, daddy, you're so funny and smart. Mm, Car daddy, tell me some more anti Semitic jokes, please. Mm. Ford is so witty. (laughs) And at the Nuremberg trials in uh, 1946, a youth leader, um, I, I wrote Withing. That's wrong. Uh, <laughs> I think he, uh, he was a, a youth leader of the uh, National Socialist German Students League named uh, Balder von Schirach, which is a very funny name. <laughs> Balder von Schirach. He described being radicalized by the writings of Henry Ford. Quote, the decisive anti-Semitic book, which I read at the time, and the book which influenced my comrades was Henry Ford's book, The International Jew. Because... In Europe, it was published as four volumes as a book. Mm -hmm. In those days, this book made such a deep impression on my friends and myself because we saw in Henry Ford the representative of success. In the poverty-stricken and wretched Germany of the time, youth looked toward America, and apart from the great benefactor Herbert Hoover, it was Henry Ford who, to us, represented America. And I like that quote because I think it does speak to like the um, the seriousness of like having a platform mm. and and yeah. using that platform. Yeah. Like he represented success to a bunch of downtrodden, very easily influenced children. Mm-hmm. And he was like, be an anti-Semite. Yeah. And they were like, sure, let's do this. It's the f- first and only book they've ever uh. read. They have, they have no <laughs> Snopes to like check to yeah. see if it's all bullshit. 
He was not including Fucking his sources. <laughs> listen up, Elon Musk fans. <laughs> So uh, uh, by the late 1920s, Henry, Henry Ford's son, Edsel Ford, had actually already assumed the nominal presidency of Ford Motors, going back a little bit. But in 1943, uh, toward the end of the war, Edsel dies of cancer at the age of 49, and Henry Ford becomes president of the company again. But no one is really happy with it. Um, and Henry Ford, who was like nearing 80 at the time and had had a series of strokes, was also mentally deteriorating quite a bit. So like around the time that like the world war is happening um and he's not <coughs> proselytizing about anti-semitism as much but he's being awarded by the nazis all of his shit his 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 little like his old little fucking brain is like turning to mush yeah. in his mm -hmm. skull so in 1945 Ford's grandson, Henry Ford II, who was nicknamed Hank the Deuce. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm in. <that>. Hank! <laughs> he, uh, I thought we entered every room, sorry. He ousts Ford. Deuce, hey! Hank the Deuce, baby! <laughs> he ousts Ford and assumes control of Ford Motors. Uh, so Hank the Deuce also made sure to do some damage control as the president of the company by loudly supporting the American Jewish community <laughs> and further developing the philanthropic charity his father and grandfather founded the ford foundation the ford foundation is pretty cool pretty cool their stated goal is advancing human welfare and it pursues those goals through a series of grants and endowments given to various media legal and civil rights and arts and cultural projects uh, so fun fact about the ford foundation is a one million dollar grant was given by them in 1969 to the children's television workshop to help create and launch sesame street oh, okay. cool. and they also yeah that's so cool. they, they were the ones that were like hey go do some research into childhood development and make a TV show. Mm -hmm. They also contributed millions of dollars of bonds in efforts to fight the AIDS epidemic in the late 80s oh, and thanks. about $1 billion <laughs> in bonds to help nonprofits fight the COVID-19 pandemic. So they're a pretty cool or organization. They were originally founded by Henry Ford the first and uh, Ed, Edsel Ford, uh, but they weren't really, it wasn't like really developed into a big thing until Hank the Deuce kind of took over. Okay. Until Hank. Hank's our dude. We like so Hank. We, we like Hank the Hank. Deuce. Hank the Deuce isn't too bad. Hank the Deuce. Yeah, I'm kind of in. Yeah. The real one. <laughs> so after being ousted from his own company by his grandson, Henry Ford lived for another four years before a cerebral hemorrhage took him down Aww. that long toothy slide to hell <laughs> on April 7th, 1947 yes. at the age of 83. Rest in piss, shit bag. Yes. <laughs> Yes, long oh. toothy slide to hell. <laughs> we need to remember that for future episodes because that's great. Um, I am so glad he's done. Wow. I, so like I knew a little bit about Henry Ford and just the general sense of like, oh yeah, he was like a Nazi collaborator who was like a piece of shit. I didn't know that he was, that like Hitler was his stand. Like Hitler was like his simp. Yeah, like yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> Did not know <laughs> that. Simping that hard. really threw me. Simping, Simping so hard. hard. Like, like he has him like, he has like a little <sighs> altar in his house where he's looking up and like today I'm going to make you proud. <laughs> I have never had a life size, that. I've never had a life size portrait of someone in my life. Wait, it was <laughs> life -size? Life -size, life -size. a life-size portrait no. of him sitting next to his desk Absolutely so he could wake up every day and make out with not. it. I was just going to say, I'm imagining oh those like God. tiger beat posters from forever, like the 90s with like the <laughs> little hearts and it's like, oh, I'm making out with Justin and now I'm making out with Henry Ford. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm, going to have, life -size. I'm going to have tea with uh, Henry Ford and Walt Disney this afternoon. <laughs> how are you doing, boys? <laughs> That's how I imagine Do not his it up, Steve. talking to his two fucking portraits. Locks the door. <laughs> yeah, hey, if probably. I don't come in here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't come in. What are you doing? On the door. <laughs> He's like covering him up. <laughs> With like battle plans or something, <laughs> some stupid anti-Semitic <laughs> shit. Like, I don't know. Not battle plans. <laughs> 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 like moves his like whiteboard with like a bunch of like maps with yeah, like, like little oh. pins in them in front of it like nothing no, nothing I'm it's nothing, nothing. It's the final solution what do you think he's doing oh like, no it only took like oh. what 10, 10 12 episodes or something for us to be doing like full impressions Hitler it happens <laughs> everyone mark it on your calendars 
Ava Brown is like, please, no. babe, come have sex with me. I'm so horny. And he's like, oh, I love, he- I love Henry Ford. <laughs> I'm reading his zine. <laughs> Oh my god! I, <laughs> not okay. The fact that he was like reading his zine and like subscribed to his OnlyFans is like he would have been his Patreon like, supporter oh, for top sure. Top tier, <laughs> top tier, On the highest tier. Like doing this, like the the like the special private like <laughs> chats yeah. late at you night. Get the one on one, one on one Q and A, like that kind of yeah. for sure. What's Meet the and co- greet What's merch. the company where you can do a cameo? Oh. He would one hundred percent get a cameo every day. Setting Henry for a cameo. Yeah, of Henry Ford Request. just saying, "I'm proud of you, son." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, oh, this no. is a wild ride. Who's? I feel like your last couple ones have just been really wild. It's amazing. Bangers. Good Thanks. job. Uh, these people suck. Um, they suck so hard. And that's that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. I'm still reeling. <laughs> uh, just anybody having a life-size poster of, like, anyone, <laughs> like, is, is like, a, like, a real human person. As an like, adult not man. Like a, it's okay when you're 13. Yeah, like a, a gr- <laughs> as a life-size is still weird. Like, <laughs> like a full cutout. Full it's cut like, out. even the feet. It's like, it's like, <laughs> like, just a big poster is one thing. But, like, it's like, no, I need the feet. I need the feet there. And I need to be able to I flip it around and see the back. I need to like, I definitely, it. definitely need the feet. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to need the feet. <laughs> the feet. I'm just imagining that he actually originally bought one and he was like, um, yes, excuse me. This is only 5'3. Henry Ford is actually 5'7. <laughs> he had to like go. He was 5'10. Five 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 oh, excuse me, 5'10. <laughs> I, I wanted to know if he was taller than Hitler. <laughs> Do they ha- was he? Do they have his penis size? Yeah. Yeah. How tall is was taller. How tall, how tall was Hitler? I think he was 5'5". Five five. Hold on. Oh, he was a little guy. I, looked up Henry I was Ford. taller than him. <laughs> okay, the second thing is Hitler height. 5'6". Um, five, six. Five, six. Oh, yeah, he was a little five, guy. Six. Oh, he's no. a little guy. Oh, no, no. Hold on. Oh, I'm lying. He's He was 5'9". Oh. Or that's what oh, okay. was reported. Well, mm, he might have uh, lied I about that. I feel like he might have lied. I mean, every guy every guy that says he's 5'9". Oh, 5'8". Here we go. On celeb height. <laughs> celeb on height? celeb <laughs> height wiki. <laughs> Do you know what says, his do you know what his income is? Five, <laughs> Does it say? <laughs> okay, so five eight. Net worth. Five eight is the Yeah. Okay, so five eight is the full. I love those websites that are like Hitler height net worth. Who is he dating? <laughs> Hitler uh, husband. <laughs> Hitler husband. Henry Ford. All right. Well, that's enough. <sighs> <laughs> that's enough. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's extend it on. Bye. Bye, who it stays. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Respect the Dead. You can follow Respect the Dead on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Respect the Dead. If you want to follow us individually, you can find our socials in the show notes. And you should check out our YouTube channels. We don't shit on dead people there as often, but still, we're making tons of cool stuff. If you enjoyed Respect the Dead and would like to support us, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. Give us at least five stars and then share us with a good friend who likes venting about dead people. You can also give us some money over on our Patreon. Patreon supporters get some cool bonus content like bloopers from the cutting room floor and even coming up with a fake sponsor ad that we'll read in an episode. It has to be a fake business, though, not your MLM, honey. Thanks so much for listening. Join us every Monday for our next Worm Feast. I'm Kellen Conrad. I'm Ailey Mandy. And I'm Hoots. Bye. 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 Bye.